Well, in the first two parts of the lecture, we talked about the distribution of seagrass and a brief introduction to what it is. Next, we covered biology, so a little bit about how plants work and how they can persist underwater in the coastal zone. But now we're going to talk a little bit about their ecology. Now, seagrass form the base of some extremely important uh, food webs. They support a diverse community of invertebrates and vertebrates, and these include commercially important fish species. And these tend to either feed, or organisms tend to feed directly on the seagrass. They can feed on some of the dead matter that's associated with seagrass, which we call detritus. And they're also feeding on algae or seaweeds and microalgae that occur within the seagrass beds. So if we look at this food web, what we can see here is that these three uh, parts of the system, seagrass, epiphytes and algae, detritus and microalgae, are supporting consumers. So for example, seagrass directly uh, are, are grazed on by dugongs and turtles and some echinoderms, uh, which include sea urchins, for example. The epiphytes are grazed on by small fish and crustaceans, while the microalgae and detritus, the dead stuff in the system, feed fish. They feed other uh, organisms like sea cucumbers or beche de mer. Now these animals that graze on the, the, the lower parts of the food web are then in turn grazed on by other organisms. And these include the silver fish that we like to eat, like whiting. They include prawns and uh, other carnivorous fish, large white fish that prey upon smaller things that humans like to eat. So finally, you're moving up the food chain to organisms like sharks, uh, birds of prey. And there's one thing that's really missing from this picture, and that's humans. So in later lectures with Professor Mumby, Peter Mumby, you're going to be talking about the influence or you're going to learn about the influence of humans on marine food webs. Now one of the things that I've referred to again and again through this lecture is mega grazers, the large grazers of seagrass communities. And this is a picture of a dugong grazing seagrass. Now these are important animals and they're endangered in parts of their range. The manatees of Florida, for example, are an endangered species, while dugongs are threatened. So obviously, if we wish to conserve these species, then conserving seagrass beds are a very important part of that uh, solution. Now, animals like dugongs and manatees disturb the community and they actually alter how the plant community, how the seagrass bed is and how it looks. Their repeated grazing means that fast growing smaller species are favoured. And so this way, the dugongs are actually cultivating a habitat that's more suitable for them. And this is sometimes referred to as cultivation grazing. But in addition to grazing, floods, intense storms, they can also uh, remove seagrass beds and they also favour the regrowth of small species, small fast growing species. And over time, usually, the diversity of the meadows increases. So we've thought about how seagrasses respond to disturbance. Now this here I want to talk about what are some of the ecosystem functions that seagrasses perform that, that make them valuable assets to communities that have seagrasses in their coastal zone. The first thing is that they're really important for coastal protection. If you look at this slide you can see that what seagrasses do is attenuate wave energy and flow rates of water. By doing so, they're actually reducing the chance of erosion on the coast. This process of slowing water down and slowing wave energy or dampening wave energy results in particles that are suspended in the water column dropping out to the seabed 
And that's a very important process in increasing the water quality, so increasing the clarity of the water. And it also supports what in this slide we've called vertical accretion, which is the capacity of the seabed to rise up or to keep pace with sea level, to add in volume over time. Seagrass also stabilise sediments and stop the sediment from being kicked up every time that there's a storm. Now in addition to these sort of very physical processes, they also support fisheries production and we looked at that in the food web diagram. And in some places there's extraction of products. For example, you do see seagrass matting on sale in many furniture shops throughout the world. The final thing that we'll talk about is carbon sequestration. Now below there's a link to an abstract from a recent paper that asks you to consider the role of seagrass in climate mitigation and the importance of soft engineering solutions to adapting to climate change. So seagrass are important for commercial fisheries and I think this deserves special attention in this lecture. They do this because seagrass meadows are nurseries for some fish species, so they're vital for some stages in the life cycle of commercial fish. Another thing that the science around coastal uh, zone management and coastal productivity is giving us to think about is that seagrasses are more productive or there's more fish when seagrasses are adjacent to man mangrove forests or coral reefs. So if you have these ha habitats collectively in good shape in the landscape, you will maintain higher productivity of fish species, so higher abundances. Now using an example from my own country, you can see that in this example, $235,000 worth of lost fisheries production occurred when 12,700 hectares of seagrasses in South Australia was lost. Now if you're interested in the valuation of ecosystem services of marine habitats, then I point you to the paper by Barbier et al. in, or Barbier and others, in the journal Ecological Monographs. Now one of the services that seagrasses uh, perform for communities is that they sequester carbon dioxide or carbon that was carbon dioxide and they sequester it within their sediments, so within the uh, below ground parts of the seagrass meadows. Now science has recently shown us that seagrass sediments are a globally significant stock of carbon and this is mainly occurs because of the low oxygen concentrations in seagrass sediments that basically limit decomposition of that biomass that was deposited there from the roots. They also trap carbon from elsewhere and we talked about that in the slide where we talked about that seagrass can slow water and particles drop. So for example particles that come from the land uh, carbon that's in the soil of uh, uh, forested systems that when it arrives in the coastal zone the slowing of the water volume the water velocities by seagrass lead to the trapping of that carbon within the seagrass meadow sediments. Additionally with adding of sediments and root growth the volume of seagrass sediments increases over time so carbon is continually sequestered now because of these huge stocks that are within the seagrass meadows, it's very prudent of us to try and conserve them to prevent emissions of carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. Now if you want to read a paper on this topic, then please uh, see the link below to a very recent paper on the carbon stocks within seagrass beds of the coastal zone.